we are going to talk about industrialized nations. We are going after the Cold War. Once again, we're talking about modern world history. This is post-World War II. Now we're going post-Cold War. Let's talk about Germany. Germany, 1990. So we're talking post-Cold War. 1990, the, uh, what was it called? The Berlin Wall fell and Germany was reunited. This was overall on a global scale, this was a good thing. Germany was reunited. But while it was a good thing, some there were some growing pains. A bunch of the, the government run factories in the East were closed down. And so unemployment shot way up in the East. So there were a bunch of people in Eastern Germany out of jobs. So there were a bunch of really unhappy people in the East. And because things were, people were struggling in the East, people in the taxes in the West were going up. So let's draw a little picture. Here's, this is my pathetic picture of Germany. This is where the Berlin Wall was. And in the East here is now lots and lots of unemployment and poverty and poor people. And over in the West, taxes are going up. So people over here are angry. Let's see if I can make an angry face. People over here are angry because they're having to pay more taxes to help people over here that are angry because they've lost their jobs. So everybody's mad. These people have lost their jobs because their factories are closed. The factories were closed because they weren't making any money. People over here are angry because they're having to pay more taxes to pay for these people because they don't have any jobs. Everybody's mad. Now, neo-Nazi groups, neo-Nazi, neo means uh, kind of after people that are, um, how do I explain neo-Nazis? They're acting like the Nazis are rising up and they're blaming foreigners on all their problems. Same old, same old. We've heard this a million times before. They're blaming some other group on all their problems. We're poor, we're suffering, and it's all somebody else's problem. It's all somebody else's fault that we're poor. Well, they're poor, they're suffering, their factories have been closed down, and of course, it's the foreigner's fault. Well now, neo-Nazi groups are rising up and becoming more and more popular all over Germany again. Well, not again, they're not Nazi groups, they're neo-Nazi groups. So this is the first time. Okay, neo-Nazi groups are becoming popular. The uh, factories in the East have been closed down. So people are out of work and poor in the East. In the West, they're having to pay more taxes to pay for the people in the East and people are upset. That's what's going on in Germany. Overall in Europe, the, uh, ah, so hold on. Okay, that was Germany. Then the collapse of then, we talked about the collapse of the Soviet Union. When the collapse of the Soviet Union happened, the Warsaw Pact fell apart, of course, because the Soviet Union fell apart. 
the Warsaw Pact fell apart. And let's just write Warsaw Pact. Warsaw Pact fell apart. A whole bunch of Eastern European countries that were part of the Warsaw Pact now joined NATO. And when they joined NATO, Russia was not happy about that. Russia was not happy when Eastern European nations started joining NATO. And yeah, okay. So um, then this other group came about called the European Economic Community. And this was a group of European nations that got together. It was kind of like NATO, except it was European nations that got together that thought, hey, let's all work together and work out a trade system and like an economic system to where we can work together and trade together and uh, trade our services and we can all get, get along together and we can all be friends, yay! Well, in 1993, this European economic community began being known as the European Union. Union. I'm sure you have all heard of the EU, the European Union. And the European Union works for freer flow, freer flow of capital, that means money, capital, labor, that means work, services, and goods. So if someone is, let's, this is one EU, member nation, and this is an EU member nation, and here's John. John is a citizen of this nation, and John moves over here. John can work here because both countries are EU members, but this country down here is not an EU member. And John moves down here. Well, he can't work down here. He can't work here. He can only work in an EU nation. And the same thing, they can trade goods, they can trade services. That means uh, do work for someone else. Like, um, I don't know, go and, uh, I, I've lost my train of thought. I don't know, give someone a massage, uh, do, do some kind of work for someone, teach someone how to do something. And uh, that's what the European Union is in, in a short, short example. And the European Union came up with their own money called the euro. 
Now, the European Union itself has 27 nations. There are 27 countries that are members of the European Union and 17 of them use the Euro. And those countries are called the Eurozone. The Eurozone are the countries that use the Euro. These are all changes that have happened post Cold War. All right, now let's talk a little about Russia post-Cold War. All right, so when the Soviet Union collapsed, Russia was almost destroyed. It was bad. Russia almost ceased to be. It was really, really, really bad. They were completely broke. They defaulted, defaulted on their international debts. I don't know if you guys know what default means. To default means like if, if I borrowed money from you and I said, I'll pay you back on Friday. And then Friday comes around and you said, hey, Mrs. Gibbons, it's time to pay up. And then I was like, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. I, like, I don't have your money. And you were like, okay, well, when are you gonna have your money, my money? And I was like, no, I'm, I'm not ever gonna have it. You know, it's serious. Like you have to really believe that I honestly don't have the money. I really, I am completely, completely broke. I don't have it. That's what defaulting is. You're completely, completely broke and you don't have the money at all. Well, that happens to Russia. They defaulted on all their debts. They had nothing and they were just broke. They lost everything and uh, things were bad. And um, that was 1998. They barely, barely avoided complete economic collapse. And then in 2000, this guy, you probably recognize this name here, likely Vladimir Putin took control of Russia. Now, there are so many things I can say about this person. There are people that love Vladimir Putin. There are people that hate Vladimir Putin. Certainly, Putin's office is full of corruption. Certainly, his office is full of human rights uh, violations. Absolutely. It is. There are people that love him. There are people that hate him. It's full of corruption. It's full of human rights corruption, human rights violations. But what he has done for sure, is he has brought Russia back from almost 
extreme annihilation to some kind of economic power. Has he done that through corruption? Has he done that through human rights violations? I'll go back to some people love him and some people hate him. But in 1998, Russia was at a point of almost complete, utter destruction. And today, uh, 20, almost 25 years later, Russia is back to, I mean, it's not like a, Russia's not a global superpower, but it's doing all right for itself. And Putin has been in power for 21 years now. That's Russia. And now we've got some changes in Asia, East Asia. Let's talk about the Pacific Rim. I wanna show you on the map. Looks as if there is a Pacific Rim movie. That is not what I want to show you. The Pacific, no, come on. There's got to be a better. Should have had this already pulled up for you. Sorry. OK. Here we are. Okay, the Pacific Rim is this area here. And specifically, we're talking right now about the Asiatic Pacific Rim. So this area here, in economics, when we're talking about the Pacific Rim, we're talking about the area along the Pacific Ocean. This, the Pacific Ocean is here. So maybe if I go, maybe I should just go to maps. Let's go to maps. Oh. Okay. All right, so here's the Pacific Ocean. And let's go from here all the way along here, all along this. This is the Pacific Rim. But mostly, if we're talking along here, the Pacific Rim, this is a big, 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 booming, booming, booming area of the economy from shortly after, through the, the 1990s, really until about 2008, this was where the economy was really booming on earth. And there was an, the, the biggest part was called the Asian Tigers. weird name, I know. The Asian Tigers. Oops, the Asian Tigers. The Asian Tigers were Taiwan, Hong Kong, I don't know why I 
Singapore, and South Korea. Do you guys know how every once in a while I like to throw in some trivia for you, or I like to tell you when, uh, it, how I like to play trivia and every once in a while I, I'll be playing a trivia game and a question will come up and I'll say, oh, 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 I know this one, I know this one. Okay, well, Asian tigers is one of those questions. It comes up in trivia games. And I promise you, if you like trivia, one day you're gonna be sitting playing a trivia game and Asian Tigers is gonna come up. I promise you it will. Just know this, even, really, even if you don't understand it, if you don't understand the words coming out of my mouth and you don't understand what I'm talking about, just memorize Asian tigers, Taiwan, Singapore, South Korea, and Hong Kong. Just remember that because it's going to come up one day. You're going to be randomly playing in a trivia game and you're going to, it's going to ring a bell Asian tigers, and you're going to say, oh, Mrs. Givens told me to remember this. Yay. Thank you, Mrs. Givens. And I hope that happens for you. And I hope you remember me for it. It'll make me really happy one day. Okay. Asian tigers, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea. Now that I've said that over and over again, let me tell you why they're the Asian tigers. So hopefully when you think of tigers, you think of these really like scary, powerful animals. Let's go back to the map. And uh, the, uh, the, um, the countries that, um, sorry, South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and I've already lost it. What else did I say? Singapore. They, they were rapidly became really, really powerful, really wealthy, and really strong in the economy post-Cold War due to rapid uh, economic growth. And that's why they're called the Asian Tigers because they, uh, because they got involved in the trade really, really quickly. And it helped because they're right here on the port. They could make stuff, whatever it was that they were making, they could make it, they could put it on ships and they could send it over the sea really quickly. They could put it on a ship and send it right over here to the United States, put it on a ship, send it to Australia, put it on a ship, send it wherever they needed to go really quickly. And uh, they just did it at amazing speeds. People worked really, really long hours for very, very low wages almost that, I mean, they worked for very low wages, very long hours, and they could get it on a ship over the seas really quickly. And there you go. They were called the Asian tiger. All right, no, let's move on. Globalization. Globalization. All right. With modernization comes interdependence. What is interdependence, Mrs. Givens? So, dependence 
hopefully you know what dependence means. We depend on each other. Well, inter means how we all, everyone depends on everyone else. Here's this person and 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 this person. Well, these are, imagine these are nations. So this nation depends on this nation for one thing. And this nation depends on this nation for something else. And then this nation depends on this nation. But this nation depends on this nation for something. And this nation depends on this nation. 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 And this nation. And if you pull one nation out, the whole thing collapses. Everybody, if you pull one out, oh, 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 I didn't mean to erase the whole thing. I meant to erase just one. But if you erase, if you take one out, the whole thing crumbles down. That's what interdependence is, is everyone is so dependent on everyone else that just one, one nation being taken out can be a real problem. So we're all interconnected with each other. And that's globalization now. We're all tied together. And now it's, it used to be that in the past, it used to be that countries weren't really so intertwined. Like Spain just did what Spain did. And Kazakhstan did what Kazakhstan did. And France did what France did, and Mexico did what Mexico did. But now we're kind of all tied in together. Now the United States really needs India. And India really needs the United Arab Emirates. And the United Arab Emirates needs Thailand because we all have workers in other places like India. Oh my goodness. I talked about this in the last lecture. Technology. How often have you called tech support for some thing, some, I don't know, some computer or phone or game that you have? How often have you called tech support and you're talking to some guy in India? We need India. How often have you needed some new blue jeans and the tag said made in China? We, we need China. Like everything is tied into other countries now. We can't even get the thing that we need in our country that we're living in anymore. Everything is globalized. And uh, so when I use India as an example a lot. When countries, when a, when a company uses employees in another country, that's called outsourcing. If, if I own a company, if I own some big tech company, and my, my tech support employees are actually in a different company, I mean, a different country, those employees are outsourced. 
if I, if all the people that work for me actually live in India, they're outsourced. And uh, let's see, this globalization is leading to multi national national well, let me multinational corporations corporations and multinational corporations can be really good for really rich people they can make them more rich like a corporation is is a business so someone that owns a corporation it owns like a business here in almaty here in in kazakhstan someone is, owns a business but what if they own a business in Kazakhstan and Russia? What if they own a business in Kazakhstan and Russia and the United States? The same business. I'm not saying they own a business in Kazakhstan and they own a different business in Russia and they own a different business in the United States. I'm saying they own one business that is that is this the exact same business that is open in Kazakhstan, Russia, and the United States. That is a multinational business. So that's great for them as long as things are going really well. What if something bad happens to their company? What if business goes bad for them? Well, then business is bad, not only in one country. Business is bad in three countries. Now, business is bad for all the businesses that they deal with. Let me draw an example. Okay, so this is gonna take some, uh, some, some doing. Okay, so um, here's the big business of, now let's make it a big business. Rah. Um, Let's say we've got Kazakhstan, Russia, and the United States. And I, I don't know what kind of business this is, but Let's say they have the, um, I don't know, I, I have to, uh, let's say this is a car salesman, car sales. Okay, so they have the business for the people that sell, they do business with tires in Kazakhstan, Russia, and US. They do business with windows. They do business with um, the people that make the seats for the cars. They do business with people that, um, uh, you've got the employees. You've got um, 
uh, the employees families. Okay, so now the car sales business doesn't do so well one year. And now the tire business is not doing well in Kazakhstan or Russia or the US. Now let's talk about all the businesses that the tire company has to deal with. Well, the tires have all their employees and all the employees' families. Families. The windows' employees and all their families. The seat company and all their employees and all their families. How about all the grocery stores that they shop at? All the grocers that they shop at, all the grocers that they shop at all the grocers that they shop at. They're, all their businesses are doing bad. Everything in Kazakhstan is doing bad. Everything in Russia is doing bad. Everything in the United States is doing bad. Everything's doing bad because this one company was doing bad. Because this multinational company was doing badly. So now it's doing badly in three countries. So while multinational corporations are great, when things are good, they're really, really bad when it's bad. Okay. So Another thing about globalization, in 1947, the United Nations made the general agreement on tariffs and trade called abbreviated GATT. And this was to expand world trade and reduce oh, reduce tariffs what are tariffs you guys i want to make sure you know what tariffs are tariffs are important to understand a tariff is a tax on imported goods when you import something that is okay so here's your ship you're bringing something into a country here's your that's that looks dumb sorry okay you're bringing something into a country and it's brought, that's supposed to be a package. It's brought off the land and you want to sell it. They tax it. 
So you, so this person has to pay extra money for the privilege to be able to sell their product in your country. If like, I just went to the United States. If I brought something back to Kazakhstan with me, I would have to pay Kazakhstan money to be able to, to sell my thing here. That's a tariff. So uh, to expand world trade and reduce tariffs, to be able to, this was something to try to make it to where it's easier to, to, to make it so that we could easily trade our stuff around the world. And in, uh, that was in 1947, in 1995, more than 100 nations formed together to make the world trade organization. To strengthen GATT. GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. They wanted to set global rules to make sure that trade could flow as freely as possible. And there was this, there, there were leaders set up called the G8. Do you guys remember the, the UN? There are, there are a whole bunch of lots and lots and lots and lots of members but there were certain members that had more power. Well, the World Trade Organization is the same way. There are lots and lots and lots and lots of members, but eight of them have more power. Well, the G8 are the ones that have the, the most power. And those eight are Canada, France, Germany, Great Britain, Italy, Japan, Russia, and the US. They're known as the G8. Really, just, just know the G8. G8. Those are the most, the most powerful. And this is really important. Very, very important. I'm making direct eye contact with you right now. It's very important to know who the G8 are. You need to know G8. Okay. And uh, they're crazy important. It's all about trade and world domination. So let me explain to you why the G8 are so important. And I want to backtrack a little bit so you'll understand what tariffs are again and why it's so important. So, okay. When a country is uh, talking about trade to uh, if This person wants to sell their thing to this person. They say, hey, I'll sell you 
my thing for, oh, uh, let's say, um, uh, no, that doesn't look the same. Okay. All right. These two are supposed to be identical things. This person says, hey, I'll sell you my thing for a dollar. And this person says, hey, I'll sell you my thing for $2. And then this person says, huh, why would I buy this one for $2 when I can buy this one for $1? And this one's like, um, mine's better. And this one's like, no, they're the exact same thing. And then this person just has to go, I don't know why. Well, you, I mean, you don't really know. And, and you don't, you, you have absolutely no idea why you would spend $1 versus $2. You don't know. I, are they identical? Are they not identical? I don't know. That, that's up to you. Okay, just keep that, keep that in your mind. So when it comes to a tariff, here's a, a ship coming in over the seas to landing. And we've got a person that lives here. That has worked really hard and made a product and sells their product for $2. But then this person comes and wants to sell the exact same product. Wants to sell the exact same product, comes and lands over here, wants to sell the same product for one dollar. Well, what does this person think about that? This person's not very happy about that because of course the people that live here are going to buy the cheaper product. And so the country that live, the country here is going to put a tariff and is going to charge this person money to sell their product. They're going to charge them money and they're going to say, uh, uh, you have to pay, you have to pay us money. You have to pay us a dollar so that at least it's the same amount of money. So it's the same so that someone that's going to, uh, someone that's going to buy will at least maybe buy our local product instead of the cheaper product. But globalization says, no, 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 no. Tariffs are bad. Free trade. These people, if they can provide if they can provide a product at a cheaper price, they should provide a product at a cheaper price and this person should have to lower their price. And so that's the whole fight with the World Trade Organization is they're trying to lower tariffs to make it so that prices stay lower so that this person here has to lower their price so that this person 
can sell their product at a cheaper price, pay their employees less money. So the factory owner pays their employees less money. This person over here makes less money and the factory owners, the rich people stay rich and the rich people stay rich. That's, that's the whole point. The rich people stay rich, tariffs stay low, and the whole world stays going the same way that it always does. The poor stay poor, the rich stay rich, and uh, global domination, the G8 gets to rule the world. Yay! Um, okay. And the only other major change that has happened with industrialized worlds, uh, and, sorry, industrialized worlds, industrialized nations since, uh, well, oh my goodness, it's not the only other thing that's happened with industrialized nations. It's the only other one that I really have time to talk to you about is, with the United States, we have terrorism or the threats of terrorism. The United States always thought they were immune to threats on or danger on their own soil. The United States had never prior to before the year 2001, the United States had never been attacked on their own soil except Hawaii. And in 2001, there was a true terroristic attack on US soil. It was the World Trade Center. And everything changed after that for the United States. Everything changed for the United States after September 11th. Two thousand one. Americans suddenly realized that a terror attack could happen on US soil and people started taking terrorism very, very seriously. And they never really had before. Terrorism was always something that happened somewhere else. It never happened at home. That's, that was a major change post Cold War. Okay. All right. I'll see you guys soon. Bye, guys.